So this is a, this is a, about a week old, Pat, but we just didn't get to it. So, um, you know, one of the companies that has a lot of investment and focus on enterprise large language models is, is called Cohere. So we hear a lot about, by the way, you know, earlier we talked about Luminous. Now we're talking yeah. about Cohere. Like it, it kind of, everything was open AI for a while, but what's happened is then it was open AI and, and, and Palm slash Bard. Then it was open AI, Palm Bard, and then Hugging Face. And now we're kind of going down the list and you know, Cohere as a company that Oracle, you know, HP tied up with Luminous, Oracle's tying up with Cohere. And basically what they're doing is looking to integrate lots of uh, generative AI capabilities into their Fusion Cloud and NetSuite, as well as their industry specific apps. So one of the things that is really interesting here too, Pat, is that, you know, we've talked to you and I about the kind of the holy grail of private data sets, public data sets. And this is where Oracle's really leaning in, you know, um, they're planning to use the Cohera foundational models to point at private data sets, not worrying about public domain data and being able to enable companies to train on smaller sets um, to be able to create higher confidence results and people that can get key benefits from all that enterprise, a, a enterprise data into their enterprise apps. So, you know, long and short is that what we're seeing, whether it's the Google generative AI app builder, or you're seeing Salesforce and their uh, GPT product or Oracle here, is you're seeing that the large software companies are saying, look, you, yes, every company can become data scientists and build their own training data sets and create algorithms and models if they want to spend a fortune, hire a ton of data scientists, buy uh, hardware that's not available in the marketplace at all right now, and then try to keep up with a pace that's unrecognizable right now. Nobody's seen a pace like this before. Or you can work with multi-billion dollar high profit companies with deep engineering uh, and data science expertise that are going to build large sets of these AI capabilities right into the applications for you that will address the Pareto 80-20 of your needs. And then maybe you can do a little bit of mod modification and customization to train for specialty needs, uh, tools and technologies. This is what that is. If you're running NetSuite, it's what are the generative capabilities to build a more uh, sufficient CEO dashboard or CFO dashboard? What are the capabilities to build quote to pay, uh, accounts receivable, generative tools, you know, that can take, you know, and, and again, you're really going to look at a multi app ecosystem, you're going to say, you know, how does an email get crafted using the data inside of NetSuite to send something yeah. thoughtful to a customer that's going to help you speed up the collection, but doing so with a very prescriptive interaction as opposed to just an automated email that gets pumped out of your system. Stuff like that. Um, so these are, um, you know, these are the, the, the opportunities. And like I said, it is a industry wide standard path. So Cohere plus Oracle compared to Salesforce plus OpenAI compared to, uh, you know, what um, SAP is doing with business, you know, uh, SAP, uh, business AI, you're going to see it from all the platforms and the players. But given what we said earlier, Pat, with Oracle's recent role, I think that they probably looked to find something very specific. They're digging in narrowly into that private data set. And I do think it is a compelling offer, especially given the strong growth that we've seen across the apps portfolio. I don't know enough about Cohere to intelligently come in. So I can't figure out if this is a, they were late to the table and, and they were the last one to dance with, you know, I have no idea because you can partner with open AI and then modify the results because open AI is the brain of it. Open AI, leveraging open AI does, that doesn't mean that every company that, that uses it, is going to get world data back. OpenAI is the brain, and then you customize uh, a level of training above it, very similar to what Microsoft is is doing with the layers that they have. Uh, and then you, the magic happens. So, yeah, it's, it's again, it's it's very hard for me to to know what the case is. I think this all comes together. Uh, if you look at OCI and what OCI brings to the table. And interestingly enough, in this latest round of, you know, the Friends of NVIDIA Club, uh, Oracle actually did quite well. And if you look at the, 
the first place that you can get access to many of NVIDIA's tools, it's on Oracle Cloud, which if you think about it, it's like, wait, they're the number three, number four. Something is is really interesting about what Oracle is doing. Now, one thing uh, that is the attractor loop is pricing, the way that Oracle does it, which <coughs> might sound pretty straightforward, but for the easy stuff, they make less profit. And for the harder stuff, they make more profit, which uh, is kind of different, very different from the way that AWS uh, prices stuff. So I'm really lo- I'm really interested in, in looking at the top to bottom stack, which is the generative AI services with Cohere plus OCI infrastructure. And, and what is that? What does that look like? Uh, because in the end, you're not just buying these services with Cohere, you're you're pretty much buying everything as, as a stack. And over time, right, pricing uh, for these types of services uh, in this full stack will come out. The really good news is, is that Oracle is a full stack provider. And when you then you add on top of it the SaaS properties like NetSuite and Fusion, uh, it's even more um important uh for them to come up with the right solution because they're going to have to you know eat their own dog food related to their SaaS apps that's delivered through a PaaS and an IaaS service yeah no i think you hit on the head pat and i think that's really where i was trying to go is generative ai is going to be a capability like um some automations were in, in, in business applications or a capability like uh, some of the business, visi- the, the data visibility visualizations that have been created. Now it's going to be generative. You know, we've already seen things, Pat, over the last few years, like, you know, attrition scoring that were being created. Now the difference is a generative tool could say, hey, this customer looks highly likely to, to defect. Um, we're going to generate an auto email. We're going to put in all these value added uh, items that we've been doing for the customer to remind them of the value. We're going to hit them up, you know, early. We're going to get ahead. You know what I mean? Like it's going to generate some some secondary assets to create value. But this is going to be built into the tools. Like companies are not going to have to build a lot of this stuff from scratch. Um, the question now is how much are what people willing to pay for these capabilities on top of what they're already paying for products, or is this going to be table stakes? And that's one of the big things a lot of people are kind of keeping eyes on is, is generative AI incremental revenue for a company like Oracle or for Salesforce, or is it a expectation within the current customer pricing and more incrementally we'll see price increases like software always does, as opposed to like truly saying, Hey, you want this new AI feature set, it's going to be a 25% bump to your current cost or Hey, um, we're going to bake this in right now because we don't want you to go to defect over to Microsoft and use their new co-pilot tools. You know, and that's going to be a, a you know, the a question for a while is in you know, the price wars. 